Good uh, morning, good afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, wherever you are in the world, we are really broadcasting worldwide and welcome to our fourth mentorship lecture. I am Dr. Chiara Gaddi and I'm one of the coordinator of the Eurocolangionet Mentorship Program. Uh, for those of you connecting with us for the first time, Eurocolangionet is a program uh, founded by the European Commission under the Cost Action Funding Scheme with the aim of promoting uh, international cooperation in the field of cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, inside our network, we have established uh, a mentorship program in 2020. Um, with, the, with our program, we matched the senior members of our network with junior members in order to support career development and career growth, especially during the time of the pandemic. And this year, we wanted to really be more ambitious, extending uh, uh, the impact of our network also to uh, the general medical field. Uh, we organized, we have organized uh, our mentorship lectures. This is our fourth lecture in which we will spotlight two career types, the physician scientist and the epidemiologist, of course, in the field of cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, after we had our second lecture on basic translational uh, research career with Professor Jesus Banales. Uh, our lectures are organized in cooperation with the International Cholangiocarcinoma Research Network, the European Cholangiocarcinoma Network. Uh, they are uh, endorsed by the European Association for the Study of Liver and by the United European Gastroenterology. And I want to thank all of them for partnering with us. And also I want to thank University La Sapienza in Rome, who is hosting our webinar. Uh, coordinating with me the program is uh, Professor Rocio Macias from the University of Salamanca, and uh, she will now introduce our guest speakers. Thank you, Chiara. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this special webinar. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. We have two exceptional examples of success in medical and scientific careers. Let me introduce our two moderators who will collect questions in the chat. So please include your questions when you want. Both of them are young investigator members of the Colangiocarcinoma Cost Action, Dr. Pedro Rodriguez from the Odonostia Institute of San Sebastian, and Andres Garcia San Pedro from the University College London. Welcome and thank you both for agreeing to participate today as moderators. I give you the floor. Thank you. So good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chiara and Rocío, for this kind of invitation and this kind of introduction. And good afternoon, good morning, or good evening for everyone in the in the session today. It's really a pleasure to be with so excellent, well-renowned researchers today here. So with no further ado, I will move to present the first speaker, which will be Dr. Rashna Shroff. Uh, doc, Dr. Rashna Shroff earned her medical degree from the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and obtained her bachelor's degree in biochemistry graduating with honors from the Brown University. She completed her fellowship in medical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, where she simultaneously obtained a master's degree at the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. She did a residency in internal, internal medicine at Washington University, serving also as a chief resident at the VA hospital. She was then appointed as an assistant and associate professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, where she, uh, she has been specializing in pancreatic and biliary cancers. While on faculty, she helped building one of the largest clinical and research programs in biliary, biliary tract malignancies in the country. In last April 2018, she joined the faculty of the University of Arizona College of Medicine as an associate professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Hematology and Oncology, and chief of the section of GI Medical Oncology in the USA. So Dr. Rashnasnov, the floor is yours. Looking forward for your talk. Thank you so much. And thank you all for the kind invitation to speak to you, uh, especially today and in, in honor of Women in Science Day. Um, you know, this is a different talk than I normally get to give. I love speaking about cholangiocarcinoma, but talking about, you know, my, my journey to getting here, I think is, is a little bit more, it was fun for me to reflect. So I appreciate the opportunity. So I'm gonna share my slides. All right, so, you know, as, as has been explained, my interest has always been in 
the, the clinical investigation and development of novel therapeutics for uh, cholangiocarcinoma, of course, uh, but GI malignancies as a whole. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, and the, the, route, the road to learning how to becoming a clinical trialist is, is a process, I think. And I think uh, it is important to discuss each of the important elements. And so that's kind of what my talk is really focusing on. Um, and so, you know, you already heard about uh, my, my background a little bit, but back when I was in training, I had, I, I don't think I recognized that I was going to end up in oncology, but when you look back in retrospect, it's actually really easy to see how all paths led me to where I am. When I was in high school, I actually did some basic science research in a lab at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. And so coming, this was a full circle for coming home for me. Um, and I think starting work in that cancer lab uh, was, was probably where this all started. And then when I started, went to Brown and started to study biochemistry, I think again, in retrospect, my interest in biochemistry came from my interest in pathways and signaling and disruption of signaling, if you will. And I, again, did a, a Howard Hughes fellowship there uh, in, a, in a lab that worked again in cancer. I then went to medical school and Jefferson has a very strong program in hematology. Uh, and so I did some electives in hematology and then just by pure coincidence during my medicine rotation, I was on an oncology service and I took care of a pancreas cancer patient. Um, and again, at that time, I mean, it impacted me in terms of how sick the patient was and how I got to hold his hand through a journey while he was inpatient, but I didn't think about where it was leading me. And then when I was at WashU, WashU has a really strong uh, bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant program. And so that's really where the, the crux of my focus was when I was a resident. And so when I applied and, and ranked MD Anderson number one for my fellowship, I actually showed up at MD Anderson thinking I was going to be a stem cell transplanter and a malignant hematologist. Uh, and I wanted to go to the largest transplant center in the country. So that's why I ranked MD Anderson. And that just kind of goes to show that sometimes best laid plans, you know, what ends up happening is, is you, find, uh, you find a new road based on who you meet. So when I got to MD Anderson, these five people have all been incredibly influential in my life in a, in a myriad of different ways. But these were all of my pivotal mentors, and some of them are continuing to be my mentors even since having left MD Anderson. Um, Dr. Jim Abruzzi's, who's the, the one all the way on the left, was the department chair of GI medical oncology. He is a huge name in pancreas cancer. And he really has been my, I call him my Yoda. He has been my guide um, throughout my, my career and helped me really understand that the best and most important part about being a clinician investigator is learning how to take good care of patients. He taught me that from the get-go. He told me that the questions come from the clinic. So focus on the clinic, which I really think is so important as a physician. Dr. Wan Ki Hong, who has passed away, uh, was our division of cancer medicine chief at the time that I was a fellow and junior faculty at MD Anderson. This man is incredible. He was, um, he, he had pioneered uh, certain discoveries in head and neck cancers. He sat on George uh, Bush's uh, Cancer Advisory Council. He was an incredibly busy, incredibly established man. And this man took the time to meet with each of his fellows. We had a huge program at MD Anderson, 45 fellows uh, total. And he would meet with each of us every three months. And he would ask us, we would sit around a table, we would have breakfast with him. And he would say, you know, what's, who's your mentor? What's your YIA, the ASCO Young Investigator Award that they always made us apply to. And he knew each of us in and out and he took such pride in his fellows and he did everything he could to ensure our success. This man on the bottom uh, right is the reason I became a GI medical oncologist. This is Dr. Robert Wolf. He is to this day what I think is the best uh, doctor and oncologist I've ever met in my life. Uh, he just taught me everything I know and continues to teach me everything I know about how important it is to focus on patient care and how to listen to your patients and to hear what their needs are so you know how to help them. Um, the top person, I, I think for a cholangial carcinoma group, I don't need to tell, uh, explain. This is Dr. Malin Jable. This is the man who helped me learn how to treat cholangial carcinoma, who I worked with side by side to build a biliary cancer program at MD Anderson, and who continues to be an incredible supporter and mentor from afar, even since I left. And then the woman on the right, Dr. Gori Bardachari, uh, has since passed away. And uh, she 
was a phenomenal physician. She taught, uh, she took care of pancreas cancer patients. So she taught me a lot about taking care of these patients. But more importantly, she was a woman. She was outspoken. She was a mother, just like I am. Uh, she worked full time with a husband who worked full time and kind of understood the push and pull that happens sometimes, especially as you're starting with young kids and trying to create a junior faculty into mid career um, career. So I did my fellowship. I thought I had it all together. You know, MD Anderson had very specific things. They, um, Dr. Hong used to call them points on a scoreboard. You need to get points on the scoreboard. So they made us apply for the ASCO Young Investigator Award. I did the, the VAIL course, which is the ASCO AACR workshop, which is methods in uh, clinical cancer research that basically teaches you how to write a protocol from start to finish because nobody really teaches you that. And then I submitted abstracts and presented at the podium at ASCO. So I was like, okay, I've got this, look at me. I'm, I'm a fellow and I've got all the points on the scoreboard like Dr. Hong said. Oops. But then reality struck and you know, there are things that are out of our control when you are a clinical trialist. Uh, so I started on faculty and this protocol that I had written at my Vail workshop, uh, which was a pancreas cancer study that was based on a, a TGF beta inhibitor. Well, you know, pharma industry things happen. And so the company that was gonna provide me with the drug decided to stop developing the drug. So I no longer had a trial that I was gonna lead as a PI, which was my plan when I started. I got pulled into faculty a little bit earlier um, than finishing my, kind of a couple months before finishing my fellowship, just because they had a need. And the need that they had was to see colon cancer patients, which nothing against colon cancer, but was not my passion. Um, and Dr. Abruzzi, my boss at the time said, I just need you to be a good team player. I need you to see these patients. I need you to help us. And then I had, as mentioned, I was working on a master's. I had to write a thesis. And for a number of reasons in politics, I had to change my thesis topic. And so I lost an entire year of time in terms of um, writing and completing my master's thesis. But I had a really great mentor, like I said, Yoda. And so these are the things that Dr. Bruzies would always tell me. And these are the things that I now tell my mentees because I think they are such, it's such sage advice. Um, take good care of patients, like I mentioned. Focus on that and the, the questions will come. Develop your niche. Um, there needs to be something that you carve out that you can call your own. It doesn't need to be a tumor type. Cholangiocarcinoma is a fantastic niche, but even cholangiocarcinoma, is there a niche within cholangiocarcinoma? Is there a niche in terms of a pathway, you know, KRAS, HER2? Is there something in particular that interests you? And then the thing he used to always say to me is, what is your legacy? There are some people, um, you know, I talked to Dr. Jablay about this once, and he said his legacy, he wa what he wants to be able to do is to say that he helped get drugs approved for cholangiocarcinoma and changed the face of the available treatments for our patients. So what is your legacy? And I think that's a really important question to ask yourself when you're trying to decide what path you want to take. So, you know, the, the way I fell into biliary cancers was by accident. So, you know, I started with stem cell transplant, ended up in GI medical oncology, and I started on faculty wanting to do pancreas cancer. And my desire to do pancreas cancer was strong because we had a fantastic pancreas cancer program at MD Anderson. But Dr. Abruzzi's, again, my Yoda, said, you know, that's great. Pancreas cancer is fantastic. I do it. I love it. But there's like 15 of us here doing pancreas cancer, and there's nobody interested in biliary cancers why don't you make that your niche? And so I kind of said, well, okay, I've never really treated a biliary cancer patient, but I'm happy to do that. And this is where the field was at the time. It was literally this, it was GEMSYS. And so in the, in the process of seeing patients is when we started to realize how many incredible opportunities there were in this disease. So the onset of me starting to see patients coincided with the development of these phenomenal next generation sequencing platforms. And so Dr. Jogley and I basically just started using NGS and started sequencing patients. And sure enough, hey, look at this, we're finding these interesting alterations. And we published kind of the initial work, and this was a huge group of, a uh, huge collaboration between MD Anderson and um, Ohio State and Mayo and a number of other institutions. But we basically pr kind of proved a little bit to industry, a little bit to ourselves and a little bit to patients that there were targets that we could go after in this disease and that there were potentially some prognostic implications. So as this was happening though, I was getting, I was getting impatient. Um, I, I would meet with Dr. Abruzzi's every other Friday because he was the best mentor and he would give me time. And I would show up in his clinic and I would say, Dr. Abruzzi's, give me a project, please. And 
he would say, no, you need to come up with your question. You need to do the, the digging and figure out where the need is and what the question is. Once you give me a, a concept, I promise you, I will have give you full support of the department. And so I literally kind of grasped at straws and I, I, did, I did what a lot of people do. Well, if it works in pancreas cancer, maybe it'll work in biliary cancer. And so literally um, I, I pitched an idea and I, had, I pitched an idea um, over a conference call because GI ASCO happened in 2013 and I had literally just given birth to this now nine-year-old boy, this little guy over here. And so I missed GI ASCO and this is my favorite meeting of the year. So I was absolutely sad to not be there. And on this conference call, I had Dr. Borad, who is one of my friends and colleagues who works at Mayo, Arizona. And we pitched the idea of a study in biliary cancers. And the company, Celgene, which is the company that had NAPAC Lataxel at the time said to us, are you joking? 50 patients in biliary cancer, there's no way you can do this. With just two institutions, that, that's gonna take forever. And I have to tell you that my typical personality is if you say I can't do something, that, that, that motivates me. So I said, watch us, just give us the chance. We will prove you wrong. And so true to his word, we went to, we got the, the, the thumbs up from Celgene. So went to Dr. Bruzzi's and I said, I need to open a multi-center trial between MD Anderson and Mayo. And Lord, was there a lot of red tape, but he helped me. He helped me navigate that process. He made sure we had research personnel. And after we had a conference call in January of 2013, the protocol of Gemesis and Paclitaxel opened finally in April of 2015. By that point in time, I had been on faculty for a while and I was starting to freak out about the fact that I had not had a chance to lead a study or publish papers, et cetera. And so Dr. Wolf, one of my other mentors, decided to throw me a bone and did give me something on a silver platter. There was a study in a, with a PARP inhibitor in BRCA, pank, in BRCA positive pancreas cancer, which he knew was another passion of mine, um, that was offered to him to serve as the PI for MD Anderson. And instead he gave it to me. Well, you know, MD Anderson sees a lot of BRCA positive pancreas cancers. And so the, even though this was a multi-institutional study, we accrued the most number of patients. And so I got to be the first author on a paper that really led to our understanding of the need for platinum sensitivity to use PARP inhibition in BRCA positive pank. So I at least felt like I was doing something and making some forward movement while this study, the Gemsis nap paclitaxel study was going. So determined to prove Celgene wrong, we enrolled fast. We enrolled so fast that our research nurse asked us to hold enrollment twice so she could breathe. Um, we had to amend the study to increase it to 60 patients. And even then we were done and reporting results at the 2017 ASCO meeting. So we accrued literally within 18 months total, 60 patients between two institutions. And then we finally published the data in 2019. So this was the study, I'm not gonna go into the science of it, but this was Gemsis nab paclitaxel in newly diagnosed biliary cancer patients with a primary endpoint of PFS. And we published the data, data in JAMA Oncology. This was a primarily intrahepatic patient population, but it was exciting. There was an efficacy signal. There was a median PFS of 11.8 months and immediate OS is what really caught our attention of 19.2 months um, with a pretty nice overall response rate and an interesting conversion rate. 20% of patients converted from unresectable to resectable disease. So based on that, you know, kind of exciting waterfall plot, um, this was all percolating when I got a phone call from the University of Arizona. And Dr. Julie Bauman, who is the division head here at hemat in hematology oncology, and Dr. Kraft, who was our cancer center director at the time, called me up and said, you know what? We need to build a new GI cancer. We need to rebuild a GI cancer research program at the University of Arizona, and we think you're the right person for it. So I'll be honest. Uh, you know, very small center compared to the MD Anderson. And I got a lot of the, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And I felt like this was a building opportunity. And I had started to realize that I enjoyed being a builder, building a builder phenotype. I had enjoyed building a biliary cancer program. And now this was an opportunity to build a research program. And so I went to my two or three sage people. And Dr. Hong, when I went to him, I thought he was going to say, you know, are you kidding? What are you doing? And he said, it was time to leave the nest and spread your wings. And I asked Dr. Wolf, my, who was my fellowship director, and as I mentioned, my mentor, and, I, and as he is a diehard MD Anderson fan, um, I thought he would also tell me I was crazy. And he said, no, 
He said, I need you to go and I need you to be the MD Anderson legacy somewhere else. And so with their blessings, I left. But I left with this in hand. This was the phase three study that came out of the Gemsys nab paclitaxel phase two. This is SWOG 1815. This is a, the first randomized study of in biliary cancers in the US uh, to date. And so it was really exciting to take this through the NCI mechanism and to know that we were, we were doing something revolutionary and landmark regardless of the outcome of the study. The study is 441 patients. It closed to accrual in February of 2021. And I will tell you that there was all kinds of people, questions again, just like Celgene had in terms of, can you really do this? Can you have 440 patients accrued? And can you open this study quickly? You know, the NCTN, the NCI gets a really bad reputation for being a slow process. Well, we opened this from start to finish in a year and, uh, and from, you know, concept to protocol. And the activation date was February, it was December of 2018. But our first patient didn't enroll until February of 2019. And as you can see, we, this was this yellow line was our target accrual. We blew our target accrual out of the water. And we accrued so fast that the initial study design was 268 patients because the NCI didn't think that we could accrue. And so I went back to them and I said, look, clearly there is a need for a frontline biliary cancer study through the NCTN mechanism. Can you please rethink this and let us do the 400 plus patients that we wanted? So we paused accrual here. That's when you see this drop off. We amended the study and then we, fit, we finished it out uh, and accrued all 440 patients in literally two years. And what's really exciting about this Regardless, we're waiting on the OS readout, that's the primary endpoint, but what's really exciting is, is A, we proved that we can do a study fast and quickly and completely and scientifically thoughtfully done, but we also prospectively collected blood and we have archival tissue. So this will be the largest prospective biospecimen repository of biliary cancers in, this, in the US to date. So there are so many questions and things that we can learn from this. So just the last thing I want to mention is, is that there's other things that I've learned from my collaborative environments. And, them, and I think the best way to, put, to mention that is, or to summarize that is to say that team science is the way to do this. You have to build your team. Um, here at the University of Arizona, I have been so blessed to be able to build a team of clinicians, physicians, healthcare providers, and researchers who are committed to making lives better for our GI cancer patients. And you know, I've done it by throwing large Diwali parties and inviting them to my house. And then during COVID having covert pizza drop-offs instead of our usual holiday parties. But you do what you need to do to be able to create a sense of loyalty around a unified mission. Because that, that is what you need when things like COVID happen. And what we knew is we needed to do something for our cancer patients. And so we activated this team and put together an investigator initiated trial in record time to assess the respon immune responses to uh, the Pfizer vaccine in patients with adult, in, in adult pa patients with solid tumors who are on active chemotherapy. And with a fantastic collaborative effort, we were able to get this paper published in Nature Medicine and help the CDC kind of recommend boosters for immunocompromised patients. And that really did not happen because of me. It happened because this team was committed to making a difference. So my takeaways, um, I think a career in medicine is a long road and it requires grit, resilience, and patience. That's what Dr. Bruzzi's taught me, patience. Um, anyone who loves patient care can be a clinical investigator. I think it is so important to find your passion. You need to know what gets you out of bed. Mentorship is key. They are not going to find you. You have to go look for your mentors and you have to hold on to them. Even when Dr. Bruzzi's left MD Anderson, I make him meet with me for a coffee at ASCO every year. And whether or not he, he likes it, I don't know. But he knows that I will reach out to him and ask him at, to be my touch point. Formal training is ideal. There are opportunities everywhere. There's you know things like the Methods in Clinical Cancer Research. There's the Ask OYA. There's this fantastic mentor program. There's, you know, ask your faculty, ask your mentors. Um, I truly believe there is nothing more rewarding than being an oncologist. Team science is the only way to bring change and progress. And I firmly believe we are here to improve the lives of our patients and there is no greater mission. My uh, mentor that I mentioned, Dr. Varadachari, uh, unfortunately passed away from lung cancer uh, a little less than a year ago now. And she used to say to me all the time, there's a time and place for all of it. Cause I would always say, Gory, you know, my kids need me now. And my, you know, the science needs me now and my patients need me now. And she would always just tell me to breathe. 
She would always tell me to recognize that there would be a time and place for everything that I wanted to do. And so in the end, I really think it's important to not forget your purpose. Everybody has a different purpose. For me, my purpose are these people on the screen, um, my husband, my two children, uh, my parents. I got to move home to Arizona and I get to spend time, I get to see my parents much more regularly than I ever did. So don't forget your purpose. That's really what will drive you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharna, for just uh, an incredibly inspiring talk. Um, I think I, I speak in the name of all the participants and especially from the young researchers like myself or, or Pedro here, like it was very, very inspiring for us also starting in the field. So thank you so much. Our next speaker today is called Dr. Jill Koshio. Uh, Dr. Jill um, here with us received her PhD in epidemiology epime epidemiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School in 2005 and subsequently joined the National Cancer Institute. She is the senior investigator in the infectious and immunoepidemiology branch of the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Prevention and her research program is focused on the etiology of hepatobiliary cancers, especially biliary cancers. Recently she has worked on sex-related factors in the pathogenesis of cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer. So thank you very much, Jill, for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Andres. And I just wish that we had an applause button because Roshna, oh my goodness, that was, that was truly inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And many thanks to Chiara and Rocio for giving me this chance to talk with you today. I'm, I'm honored because I do believe just as Roshna said, mentorship is so critically important. It's been important for me uh, and for all of us. And I, I hope that I might be able to share some thoughts and some insights that could be useful for you. So Kiara and Rocio asked me to do a couple of things today. First, to talk a little bit about how to develop an independent research project or group as an epidemiologist. And then also to talk about how to promote sex balanced initiatives early in your career. So I thought I'd do that by, similar to Roshna, telling you a little bit about my story and then giving you two examples of studies that I've conducted as a tenure track investigator prior to becoming a senior investigator uh, that have different ways at getting at sex differences. So to start, I went to school at a small liberal arts college called William Jewell College. And I really loved Jewell because this was one school that gave me the opportunity to really pursue two interests at the same time, to do a double major in music and in biology. And that was important for me because I knew I wanted a career in the biological sciences, but I also loved music and I wanted to take all of the upper level courses. So I thought I might as well get a degree while I was out of it. And Jewel allowed me to do that. But through the process of getting my degree in biology, I realized pretty quickly that I did not like being in the lab. I really didn't want to be a basic scientist. And when I considered medical school, I realized, you know, I really didn't want to be a clinician either. So what to do? Well, my dad was a pediatrician and he recommended that I consider epidemiology. He explained that epidemiologists are like the detectives of the medical world. And that really appealed to me. So I started to learn about Jon Snow and the career opportunities available in epidemiology. And then I went to UNC Chapel Hill School of Public Health to actually be trained as an epidemiologist. I did my master's thesis on breast cancer mammography in urban and rural areas. And through that experience, I realized that for whatever reason that I can't explain, Breast cancer just did not do it for me. I, I just, I couldn't get excited about it. But fortunately I had an excellent PhD advisor, Jane Schroeder, who really encouraged me to take the time to explore my interests until I found a topic that really engaged me. And that again, speaks to what Roshna was saying about you have to find your passion. This is a very long road and you have to be passionate about your work. And for me at that time, I was working at part-time at GlaxoSmithKline and they were working on developing the human papillomavirus vaccine. 
So that got me really interested in infections that cause cancer, because if an infection causes cancer, that's something that we can really target for cancer prevention, and cancer prevention is something that's important to me. A, a friend of mine put me in touch with the lead investigators from the Centers for Disease Control, who were the PIs of the HIV Epidemiology Research Study, or HERS, and that study had a lot of data on human papillomavirus with multiple sampling over many years, and that allowed me to conduct my PhD dissertation looking at human papillomavirus persistence. From there, I came to the National Cancer Institute, and initially I came as a cancer prevention fellow because I really wanted to learn how to apply my expertise in epidemiology to cancer prevention. And I started off working with Bill Taylor in the genetic epidemiology branch of the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics because he gave me opportunities to expand from the work that I'd done on HPV and cervical cancers to other infections and other cancers like Epstein-Barr virus and gastric cancer. Later, I became a research fellow in the infections and immunoepidemiology branch because that branch really suited my research interests better. Now, over time, through the process of studying different infections and their relation to different cancers, I became a little bit more broadly interested in how immunological insults like infections trigger an immune response. And that immune response often initially manifests as inflammation, which can lead to chronic immune stimulation and chronic inflammation. And that, in turn, can potentially lead to the development of cancer. So I was interested in how, by examining the role of immune response in carcinogenesis, we might find ways and targets for cancer prevention that can lead to reduction in cancer-related mortality. And that's the argument that I presented when I successfully applied for an Earl Stodman tenure track position in the infections and immunoepidemiology branch. But shortly after getting onto tenure track, my initial plans of studying lung cancer and cervical cancer all kind of fell apart. And I had to find a, a, new, a, a new niche, a place that I could call my own and build my own research program. So I spent some time exploring different options. And eventually I talked with Ann Singh, who was at NCI at the time. And she told me about biliary tract cancers. And that just lit a fire in me. These cancers, I think, are fascinating because even though we know that each cancer at the different anatomic sites in the biliary tract has a different epidemiologic profile and a different molecular profile, inflammation really seems to be a common theme, a very central factor for all of these cancers. And infections have also been proposed to contribute. So for me, these cancers really had it all. And on top of that, they are rare cancers. Uh, very few people study these cancers, which again, just means that everything that we do contributes to our understanding and our ability to do something about these cancers. And moving on from me and my history, I want to give you these two examples of approaches to address sex balance study designs. The first one is the Chile Biliary Longitudinal Study or Chile Bills, which is a cohort of women with gallstones that I started while on tenure track. And as you'll note, this is not a sex balance study design because all of these people are women. But I wanna give you some thoughts and insights onto why we took that approach. Just by way of background, Chile has a very high prevalence of gallstones, which are the most important risk factor for gallbladder cancer that we know of. And it also has among the highest rates of gallbladder cancer in the world. Now, the thing about gallstones is that even though the majority of gallbladder cancer cases have a history of gallstones, most people with gallstones will never go on to develop gallbladder cancer. And in fact, most people with gallstones won't even know that they have gallstones. So a really important question is what drives the development of gallbladder cancer among individuals who have gallstones? To address this question, we recruited 29,000 women aged 50 to 74 and screened with ultrasound 19,000 women to identify a cohort of 4,726 women. We're currently in the process of following these women. We'll continue to actively follow them through mid-2024. At that point, we expect to recruit 95 to 115 high-grade dysplasia and cancer cases. 
Now, of course, it would have been ideal to recruit both men and women in this study, but we focused on women because they're twice as likely as men to have gallstones. So from that screening perspective of doing ultrasound to find gallstones, women give you a greater yield. And they're also twice as likely as men to develop gallbladder cancer, so more outcomes. So we really focused on women for the sake of efficiency. But we did come up with a strategy uh, that we think is a good compromise, which is to use men from the Chilean government-sponsored MAUCO cohort as a comparison. MAUCO is a general population cohort that's conducted in the same region of Chile that has very high risk of gallbladder cancer, and it includes 371 men with gallstones, which gives us the opportunity to explore similarities and differences with women who have gallstones in chili bills. Before moving on from chili bills, I just want to give you a sense of the history of the study. Large scale epidemiologic studies take an enormous amount of time and energy. So you really have to have a lot of pilot data before you can get going with a kind of study like this. And that pilot work is work that I started just right at the beginning of my tenure track career. Once we had the pilot data, it then took years to develop the, the protocols and the procedures and to get the approvals. In fact, it was five years from the time we initiated the pilot to initiating Chile bills in 2016. And right now we're in the middle of the four year visits, which began in September of 2020. And again, we plan to continue active follow up of participants going to cholecystectomy through mid 2024. And we've already begun publishing papers from Chile bills, but we won't actually be able to conduct the main studies that we really want to do until we get to that end of active follow up, because that's when we'll have enough cases to to see what associations are there. And I just share this with you to give you a sense of, of how long this kind of study takes and how much persistence and fortitude you need. In fact, everybody needs to be successful with this kind of study. The second example is the Biliary Tract Cancer Pooling Project, or BitCap. And for BitCap, we took a different approach. Here, the idea was to pull together as many different existing cohorts as possible so that we could really prospectively evaluate the etiology of cancer across the entirety of the biliary tract. BitCap includes 30 prospective studies with about 3 million participants and over 5,000 biliary tract cancer cases. And here I'm just showing you the breakdown of cases and non-cases from each of the 30 cohorts involved. I put this up here so that you can see, you know, many of these cohorts really aren't contributing a large number of cases. Again, keep in mind, these are all biliary tract cancer cases. And we know that really to understand the etiology, we need to look at each individual anatomic site. So each cohort in and of itself doesn't necessarily contribute a lot, but when we pull them together, they give us enough cases to be able to investigate associations, not only with gallbladder cancer, but also intrahepatic bile duct, extrahepatic bile duct, and ampulla of bladder cancer. And to be able to look at associations at each of these sites, both in men and in women. To give you a sense of how we're digging into sex differences, I want to briefly describe some results from my postdoctoral fellow, Sarah Jackson. She is super interested in sex differences in cancer, and she thinks that biliary tract cancers are a particularly good model for trying to understand sex differences because there's really a striking disparity in the sex ratio across the biliary tract. As I mentioned for chili bills, gallbladder cancer is on average about twice as common in men as in women, but the other biliary tract cancers tend to have a male predominance. Now, it seems reasonable that the gallbladder could be affected by hormones because it expresses both estrogen and progesterone receptors. And a previous study has found that higher levels of circulating estradiol are associated with increased risk of intrahepatic bile duct cancer in women. So Sarah sought to understand how sex hormones might affect biliary tract cancer risk using female reproductive factors as a proxy in BitCap. Here in the panel on the left, you can see that we found increasing number of live births was associated with gallbladder cancer and intrahepatic bile duct cancer, but not with extrahepatic bile duct cancer or ampulla of water cancer. In the panel on the right, increasing age at menarche was associated with increased risk of gallbladder cancer, intrahepatic bile duct cancer, and extrahepatic bile duct cancer, 
but only among Asian women, as indicated by these light blue circles, not among non-Asian women, as indicated by these dark blue circles. There's biologic support for the finding between parity and gallbladder cancer because pregnancy increases the risk of developing gallstones due to hormonal and physical changes. The associations that we observed with intrahepatic bile duct cancer suggests that hormones also affect intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, although our findings were a little bit borderline, so it's definitely something that we want to dig into and understand better. Later age at menarche was associated with increased risk of gallbladder cancer, intrahepatic bile duct cancer, and extrahepatic bile duct cancer, but only among Asian, not non-Asian women. And that's interesting because non-Asian women have a lower BMI than women of other ethnicities, and that could potentially delay puberty onset. And the fact that later age of menarche was only associated with increased biliary tract cancer risk in Asian women might also suggest that there's a different etiology in Asian women compared to non-Asian women. For example, brown pigment stones rather than cholesterol stones are some of the predominant gallstones in some parts of Asia. And they're the result of parasitic infections like liver flukes. This difference in gallstone etiology also fits with the descriptive epidemiology, since this two to one ratio that we see is more predominant in Western countries and that ratio is smaller or sometimes even reversed in many East Asian countries. Now we're following up on this work by doing a couple of things. First, we're using existing data that we have in hand to try to understand the effect of exogenous hormone use. So menopausal hormone therapy and oral contraceptives and biliary tract cancer risk. But we're also very interested in evaluating circulating sex steroid hormone levels and biliary tract cancer and extrahepatic bile duct cancer risk in postmenopausal women and in men age 50 and above. And this is something that we're really excited about because here we can directly measure hormones. So we know what we're looking at. We really want to do it both in men and women so we can see directly how those associations compare. We're still working on funding, so hopefully we'll be able to get some funding to move this project forward. But if we do, we estimate that from 10 cohorts in BitCap that have blood available, we should have enough cases to be able to detect odds ratios, but at least two for the highest quartile compared to the lowest quartile of hormones in men and women at both the gallbladder and the extrahepatic bile duct sites. So just to give you a few take home messages, epidemiologic studies take many years. So it's important to be persistent, just keep at it. And even with that timeline that I showed you for chili bills, that started in 2011, but it really started back in the year 2000 when Katerina Ferreccio, the PI from Chile came to NCI and started trying to get people interested in this question of why are gallbladder cancer rates so high in Chile? But because of her persistence, and my getting involved as well, we're able to conduct this study that is really going to give us enormous insights into what drives the risk among people with gallstones. Another important point is that, as you've seen, epidemiologic studies, they require large, multidisciplinary, often international teams. There are many different moving pieces from developing the protocol, from interacting with participants and getting data and samples, to cleaning the data and actually publishing the data, takes a lot of time and energy and many, many different people from many different disciplines. So it's very useful to build those teams and to expand your understanding of, of different areas of research. Also, sex different strategies for sex balanced initiatives vary depending on the circumstances and the specific question that you're interested in. As you saw for Chili Bills, we focused on women for the sake of efficiency but we also identified an opportunity to compare with men. For BitCap, we leveraged existing resources and we went kind of for brute force by including as many different cohorts as possible so that we could evaluate associations across the entirety of the biliary tract. Another strategy I didn't touch on today, but really can be very effective, particularly for rare cancers, is to take a case control approach where you can recruit cases and identify controls that represent the population from which those cases arose. And one final thing that I want to touch on, I really want to emphasize is that 
as Roshna said, it is critical to have a good team and recruiting good fellows is essential to this work. I've had the privilege and the honor of working with a number of primary mentees. And without these mentees, none of this work would be possible. I also wanna just close by saying that as important as work is, it's not the only, the only part of life. So I encourage you to cultivate other activities and interests and those can change over time. So just to give you an example, since I joined the National Cancer Institute, I've at different periods pursued horseback riding, ballroom dancing, and producing music. I actually have an album dropping tomorrow. You can check it out if you're interested. But I really just bring this up to give you the understanding that you can have a life outside of work. You do have to be intentional about it, but it's not only possible, it's important. And what that looks like is different for everybody. Everybody has different circumstances, but there are so many possibilities. You know, engage in physical activities, in music, in cooking, in visual arts, finding ways to be creative outside of science and medicine will expand your ability to be creative inside of science and medicine. And with that, I think we're going to have questions. Thank you so much for these excellent and inspiring talks. I think I'm I'm really thrilled and I got a motivation boost to, to pursue my research now. Um, I would like to remind the audience that we, we are waiting for questions either in the chat or in the Q&A um, app. So please feel free to ask anything you want. And if you allow me, may I start with, uh, with a question? I, the question is directed for both of you. I would like to know, for example, what were the major drawbacks or difficulties that you faced throughout your career? What would you say that what was the biggest challenge that you faced uh, to reach the position where you both are? Um, I guess I can start. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's first important to say that there's always kind of unexpected things that come along in your journey. I mean, that, that was kind of the intention of my, of my talk, but, um, you know, challenges for me, uh, I am, I think, a, a people pleaser. And so it has been hard for me to figure out uh, my, my, my no, like, what is my boundary? What is my limit? What can I do? And what can't I do? And what shouldn't I do? Um, you know, I think the, the great thing about science and biliary cancers and medicine and all of these things is once you demonstrate your you know interest passion capabilities etc oftentimes you end up with 17 things offered to you and i have um still struggle <laughs> with figuring out what is where where do i say yes and where do i say no where do i put my time because to to jill's point i mean that was a beautiful talk jill and to, to her point, you know, while my work is important to me, it's not my everything. And, um, you know, especially in this Zoom world, there's this creep into my personal time that I've had to just figure out how to define boundaries. Um, you know, I have a 13 year old and a nine year old who need me. I have, I, I have a lot of other people who need me. And so I think it's really important. And what I tend to do is, is I, when I'm asked to do something, I, I try to think about what is this going to ask like what does this require of me time input etc and what is the output you know and you know i know what it, i am passionate about i try to then decide if that fits within that passion but that has always been a struggle for me i think there are there are a lot of challenges so it's it's sometimes it's hard to, to pick one but um i think you know something that many of us struggle with are imposter fears, you know, this sense that that I don't actually know what I'm doing. And at some point, everybody's going to figure that out and kick me out. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you can run into people who foster those fears. Actually, when I was a master's student, I had one of my mentors tell me, you know, not everybody is cut out for epidemiology, not everybody's cut out for research, you know, and and but fortunately for me, I was a little bit like Roshan and I'm like, oh, well, let me show you how I'm cut out for research. <laughs> but, 
but you but you do sometimes get feedback that you really have to stop and think you know is this true what's the evidence to support it what's the evidence against it uh and then and to remember we also tend to focus on the negative things like if something goes wrong it's the worst thing ever but and it washes out all of the many things that have gone right so i think remembering what's gone right. And this is also where mentors can be super helpful to keep you grounded and to come back and just to remind you, you know, it, things seem awful, but this has happened before, it'll happen again, it'll be okay, we'll get through it. Let's come up with some strategies for how to address this problem. I, I completely agree with you that, uh, that that's super important as well. Um, I think we don't have any questions yet, so I encourage everyone, uh, all the attendees, uh, we know that you are there, so just pull up some questions in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, but if not, I would love to ask, I, I loved both of your talks, that was uh, really, really inspirational. Um, so I wanted to ask, you both have talked about your mentors, which are which have been super important for you and your career development, but um, also you are now well well positioned in the, in the field and within your institutions as well. So at some point you become mentors for other people in your group. So I wanted to ask you if there's something that you like to do as, as mentor for your mentees and if you have any tips for other young leaders um, that could be here with us uh, listening to this mentorship lecture, something that you, you like to do to encourage the career development of the young researchers in your group. Yeah, you know, I I think, and people who have heard me talk about mentorship have heard me say this multiple times, but I think the most important thing I try to recognize is that there's a difference between mentorship and sponsorship. And I think it's important for me to be both to my to my mentees. And so mentorship is, you know, the people, like, just like I described my mentors, you know, the people who I have ones who are kind of overarching, help me figure out my career vision and help me with major decisions and turning points in my life. And then I have ones who are my day-to-day -day or day-to-day -day boots on the ground mentor, like, hey, can you read this protocol? How does the study design seem? And I think it's important to have that whole panel of mentors. But what I think is often not spoken about is sponsors. And, you know, sponsors to me are the people who open doors. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, a career is, is, absolutely about grit and and you know perspiration but it's also about you know having opportunities for being on a podium having opportunities for being on national and international committees or being invited to speak um, because that's how people get to hear you and um you know i have been lucky to have sponsors who have opened those doors for me and i am now i try to be very cognizant of making sure that I not only mentor, but I sponsor. And, you know, if I'm on an ASCO committee and they ask me for suggestions, I try to put my name, my, my juniors names in because that's the only way that they can get up, up and involved in that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Roshna, this too. That as a, a mentor, I try to look for opportunities for my mentees um, but also, and I, you, you were kind of alluding to this, we, we ask mentors to be a lot of things, right? We ask them to give us scientific insight and information, to be advocates, to be shields, to be uh, door openers. Um, and the truth is not, one person can't be everything that you need for your career. So I try to encourage my mentees to have other mentors. In fact, we have mentorship committees throughout our division. So we think together about, okay, who would be the best group of people to meet every aspect of your career pathway that you need to help you along that road? Totally agree. We have one question from the audience. Um, they are asking if, have you ever faced any discrimination during your career, either by your own age and if I'm allowed, my, I will add something to the question. Since we are celebrating the International Day of Women in Science, did you also face any discrimination by the fact that you are women, that you, that you face any problems with that? One part from being so young and being a very world known leader in the field and also on the other part from being a, a woman? You know, I think, yes, short answer. Um, you know, I think the young thing was definitely hard. I mean, especially, I have to tell you, like, as a 
as a like short little Indian girl, um, you know, I, I used to get it from, from patients too. They're like, do you really know what you're talking about? Like, have you been doing this a while? And I'm like, yeah, I've been doing this 12 years. Like, I, yes, I know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I, I get it to this day. I, you know, we just had our NCI site visit for my comprehensive cancer center. And when we were going through rehearsals, people were like, she looks like she's 12. I'm like, okay, but <laughs> but I, I do know what I'm talking about. So, you know, you just have to, it's, it's a little bit of just, I take it as a compliment now that I feel much older and I'm like, okay, great. I look like I'm 12, but it is a little bit of just having to reassert that no, you know, I'm trained in this. I've been doing this. I, I, I know what I'm doing. Um, I think the gender one is, is harder. Uh, you know, I think that there is implicit bias and then there's explicit bias. And, you know, there's a lot, I mean, ASCO has published about, how, you know, and I've heard it myself, how I will get introduced as Rachna and the male panelist that I'm with gets introduced as doctor um, and, you know, things like that. But there are also, I think there is whether or not I have a phenomenal partner. My husband is incredibly supportive of my career. He steps up when I'm traveling and doing things for work. But at the end of the day, I feel a pull that is a little bit different as a mother and a, and a you know, a, a wife and a daughter and all the other things. And I think I have the things that I have experienced sometimes has been more about having having people have a hard time understanding the fact that, you know, I, I can't be at work on the weekends writing my papers and, and you know, I can't, I, I've got soccer games to get to, I can't be on a Zoom call at 8pm and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I have been blessed in the sense that even my male and female mentors have been amazing about doing things to amplify my voice and making me feel empowered to speak and to represent. And I will tell you that I am incredibly passionate. I'm very active on, we have this thing called the Hemonk Wolf Pack on, on um, Facebook and all these other things. And I'm very passionate about in, encouraging and empowering women, especially in the biliary cancer world, but in, in oncology as a whole. So I, I try my best to pay it forward. Yeah, I agree. Certainly I've experienced both age and sex related, eh, hmm, different, like it, I would have been viewed differently had I been a man, regardless of age, but especially if I were an older man. Uh, and that it, like, I've noticed it particularly in the work that I do in Chile, because it's a, it's a very patriarchal um, culture. And in fact, I remember I gave a talk once to a bunch of surgeons and the guy who invited me, he's like, yeah, they were all very confused. They were expecting a little old lady with a bun on her head. And I too look, you know, much younger than I actually am. Um, and I also do think that even here in the US, there is a, there's a, the established culture comes again from a very patriarchal approach which can have an impact even on how you are perceived that you you're, that you're supposed to interact that and it's it's not fair right like if you are assertive as a woman you're considered aggressive um but if you are assertive as a man that's just you doing what you need to do um, and i agree with rashna that this is again where mentorship is super helpful you know to have more senior people who have supported me along the way, who have been my advocate, um, who have encouraged me to do things that for me with the gender role and the culture that I grew up in are hard for me to do. Um, and that's, that's where the success comes from. It's really through that teamwork of working through whatever culture or environment that you're in. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with with everyone. Um, we've got one last question from the from the audience, uh, and it says, "Do you think it helps to have women as role models in leadership positions, so that younger women see it as something normal that they could also achieve?" Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it was. You know, I had Gory Brother Charlie's picture up there. It was inspiring to me to see somebody who, at least on the surface, I mean, once, you know, once I got to know her better, it's, it, it every, there's complexities to everything, but, you know, who, who could do it all, who could command a podium and who could raise two incredibly wonderful, smart daughters and, you know, win the clinician award of the year for taking fantastic care of her patients um, while, you know, sitting on guideline panels for carcinoma of unknown primary. Um, so to me, I, I, I take it, I, 
I, I hope that I take that very seriously myself and I try to recognize, I mean, I do this for my daughter, I hope, but especially even for junior faculty, um, you know, at, at GI ASCO and ASCO and all of these types of things, um, you know, that hopefully by me standing up there, I am letting people know that it is possible to get up there. And I encourage those people, I hope, to reach out to me so that I, you know, so that I can provide that mentorship and sponsorship and, and open those doors for them. Yeah, and certainly female role models have been really important for me as well. Um, I, I mentioned Jane Froder, my PhD advisor. She, I really have to attribute a lot of my success to her just because she was so incredibly supportive. Um, and this was, you know, at the same place where one person was like, yeah, you're not cut out for epidemiology. She was like, no, you are. You can absolutely do this. We're going to make this happen. Uh, and if it weren't for her and her support, I certainly wouldn't be where I am today. Um, and I also think just more broadly in society, representation matters. It, it helps to see women in leadership roles, to see women doing things that traditionally have been male dominated. Um, and to see that we can, that it doesn't have to be women dominated either, right? That, that, that men can also perform in, in roles that are traditionally considered women's jobs, right? That, that none of these things need to be restricted by that. And the more that happens, the more our kids will grow up understanding that they can pursue what they are truly passionate about. Totally agree. For a matter of time, I think we, we need to move on. Uh, we have a lot of questions to, to move on, uh, to, to provide and another questions in the chat, but we have to, to move on and end the session. I think in my name and in the name of Andres, I would like to thank again uh, very much uh, for this opportunity to be here, uh, to have this inspiration from your, your side. I think we all got... Um, something very good today. And I give back the word to Chiara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Uh, I, I was really inspired myself. Thank you, Arachna, Jill. Uh, as we said, today is the International Day celebrating women in science. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you, you are, you are, and you will be an amazing role model for, uh, for us all, uh, really, independent by age and gender. So thank you for sharing both your professional and also personal life. Thanks a lot, really. Thanks also to our moderators. And I'm really pleased now to announce our uh, next mentorship lecture. It will be on Monday, March the 14th, uh, 2022. And we will talk about the founding and the title of the lecture will be how to get founded. So how to get your grant to start your independent research. So thank you again on behalf of our Eurocolangionet network. And uh, we will uh, see each other again on March 14th. Thank you.